Thank you, Ralph, and thank you all for coming. I'm supposed to talk about the patient-physician relationship, and one reason I want, I want to do this is because I'm afraid that 10 years from now, we may be asking, what's that? What's the doctor? What's, how is he different from the healthcare provider? And what's a patient? Is that any different from a covered life in a managed care plan? So I'd like to tell you some stories about how the practice of medicine differs from digitized um, managed healthcare, digitized dictated by a health plan or by an insurance company. I learned about uh, private medicine from one of our oldest members, Dr. Curtis Kane, who was an anesthesiologist, and not for the usual reason of that you can't, you don't have to talk to the patient if he's asleep. And some anesthesiologists really don't like patients. But Dr. Kane was talking to a friend who had just had a gallbladder operation and did not know the name of the anesthesiologist who had slept him, which means the man who had suspended his life during the surgery. Dr. Kane was kind of horrified. He said, I practiced private medicine for more than 50 years. I knew my patients, and they knew me. By name, goodness, by face, by touch, and by voice. He attended patients. He didn't do cases. And back when I was a uh, medical student a long, long time ago, it was expected that both the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, and the medical student made pre-op rounds. The patient, by the way, was in the hospital the night before back then. And we had to look at the patient's teeth and his jaw and his neck to see whether there might be some problems, double check his allergies, double check that everything was in the chart, introduce ourselves, find out his name, and learn something about him. Last time I got my privileges renewed at a hospital in Tucson, we had to watch a video. And by the way, they could tell whether we played every minute of that video. I guess they couldn't tell whether we actually watched it, but <laughs> had to do this. And it was a little play acting by a surgeon, an anesthesiologist, and a patient who was sound asleep on the operating table. And they were doing their little pre-op check. They checked the patient's armband and went over what they were supposed to do. And I guess this might make a lot of sense as a pre-flight checklist, but it also occurred to me that it could be that that surgeon and that anesthesiologist had never laid eyes on that patient before. That's why it was really necessary, not just a precaution to go through this checklist. When I was a medical student and a resident, we had a group that was called My Patients. Not my panel, but my patients, I admitted them or, or was responsible for them. And the end of the working day was when the work was done, even though it was a 36-hour day. And we were supposed to make sure that all the IVs were functioning, that all the fever workups had been done, and that everything was okay. I mean, we did sign out to someone who was covering for us that night, but still our patients were our responsibility. We didn't, wasn't, just wasn't honorable to dump work onto the next shift. Plus, you had to make sure that the, that the work got done or the patient might suffer. But these days, the, the um, medical students and the residents are looking at the clock. Because if they're not out of there, no matter how sick the patients are, no matter what learning opportunities there might be, they'll be in violation of some side of so, kind of federal law. So they're being indoctrinated with the idea that they are shift workers, not physicians who have my patients. That now, we, with managed care, we have a panel of patients, and we have team practice. And when the patient comes in to see the healthcare provider, it uh, might not be a doctor at all. It certainly is likely to be a different doctor, even if it is a physician. And this is done deliberately because, after all, if you get to know the person, you might become sort of sympathetic or empathetic, and you might be intent on doing your best for this individual because you care about him. But it's pretty hard to care with somebody when you're punching a time clock and you've got to churn through patients every 10 or 15 minutes and they're different patients all the time. You never get to know who they are. The medical record has all been digitized and the federal government would like all of us to have an electronic medical record. 
Now, when we were making rounds back when I was a resident, we had a thing called random access memory that was between our ears. <laughs> and also, I had a little packet of index cards in my pocket which told me things that I was likely to forget, like what room is the patient in, and a few critical lab values. But we were expected to know the important stuff in our memory. And the fact is that if it's not in your random access memory, the information is not really accessible to you. It doesn't matter how much stuff is in the chart. A lot of it irrelevant, much of it inaccurate or duplicative. I can't do a Vulcan mind meld with a computer <laughs> by walking by it. I have to know the patient. Actually, the most efficient way of getting the information about the patient is to talk to him or examine him. Imagine that. But when you're being digitized and disembodied, for the benefit of the managers, you're being sliced and diced all kinds of different ways. Your age, your sex, your ethnic group, your race, your risk factors. And you'll be divided up in all these different ways so they can tell whether there are disparities in how you're treated, whether you get the stuff that you're supposed to have, and you don't get stuff that you're not supposed to have. It's probably being used to classify you by your social worthiness or by the cost effectiveness of treating you in a particular way. You're, you're not a person, they say you're just divided into all these millions of different people or different, different data packages. And when you're being managed by the healthcare team, especially if you are in an accountable care organization, which is the new deal, or the just a plain old managed care organization, which was the old deal, which really wasn't all that much different. They're using the term accountable in a, you know, in a very appropriate way. It has to do with accounting, with money, with whether the right amount of money is being spent, with whether all of the, the 65 different quality metrics are being abided by. And somebody picked these out, and it was the Secretary of Health and Human Services, our new healthcare czar, has, has uh, decided that these are the things you're supposed to keep track of uh, whether they're really measurable, how much difference they make, I don't know. But those are the things that you're, you are accountable for. And if you don't meet them, there's a price to pay. You'll get demerits. You'll get your pay docked. You may be making so little money that you can't really afford to stay in practice. And there's a kind of collective responsibility for it. If you provide too much for an individual patient, your whole team suffers. Think of the peer pressure involved here, that if you're doing too many lab tests or something, well then, the whole team could find that its bonus goes away, its so-called bonus, or that its pay is cut, and that they can't pay their mortgage, and that everybody has this in built-in conflict of interest between doing what they believe is best for their patients and their, their family, and their, their paycheck, or their, or their practice. In fact, it's kind of interesting that the new oath it's no longer the oath of Hippocrates, but something the students make up. It concerns balancing your professional duties with your life, with the, with the rest of your life. Well, back in, in the days or when a real doctor makes rounds, he goes around looking for trouble. And the only way to do that is to go to the patient's bedside. Does he have noises in his chest that shouldn't be there? Is he, is he thinking straight? Has the surgeon been by to visit? Has his family come in? Is he making water? It's not just looking at the chart and buffing the chart. It's looking at the patient and seeing whether everything really is OK or whether something could be done better. So I think if we want to, if we want to continue the practice of medicine, we need to fight to preserve the patient-physician relationship. And if we're talking about money, by the way, that is the most cost-effective way of doing it, too. In Arizona, we brag about having this really wonderful managed care system. It's got a really good medical loss ratio, which is all the rage these days. But if you look at the absolute numbers, the biggest managed care plan in Arizona Medicaid spends 15%, maybe that's not too bad, but it amounts to $100 million a year on doing all of these accounting things and all of these managing things. Whether it checks whether somebody got the right diagnosis, well, by the way, it can't, because it can't, you can't do that without going to see the patient. They don't do that. But you know, the amount that they spend on their definition of administration could buy 10,000 people a $10,000 operation. 
that might be buying somebody a BMW. You could buy more than 1,000 BMWs for just the cost of this highly efficient managed care plan that at the same time is turning physicians into providers that watch the clock, that punch things into the computer, that forget about the patients, and are turning patients into a liability for their physicians. I think we need to understand what's going on here. Um, the old-fashioned way that's been done for millennia is the only way to really practice medicine. It's the only way to protect the patients from the sort of incentives that our government is setting up. <laughs>